Well, hello, class. This is Professor Khan. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, with you in this presentation talking about the central idea. And uh, we actually have quite a bit to say about the central idea. So uh, we're going to take this presentation and divide it into two parts. Uh, this first part will just sort of lay out some of the the fundamental background behind uh, the concept of the central idea. And then the second uh, slideshow presentation uh, will be a little bit longer and that will, you know, kind of dive into the nitty gritty details about composing a central idea statement. Uh, and I'll be using the uh, Raymond Carver story cathedral as an example for that. That'll be in the second part of the slideshow. But for now, uh, let's go ahead and just talk uh, a little bit about uh, some of the background information and some of the fundamental uh, principles behind the central idea. First of all, it's important to understand, um, you know, what it is that we are examining here in this in this course. Uh, we're looking at literary short fiction, short stories. Um, these types of stories are just one, I think, type of literature. Uh, you know, we're not we're not going to be reading or studying poetry or plays or screenplays or novels or any of those kinds of things. Uh, but those can also fall under the category of literature. And I think there's many ways to define literature. Uh, I th simply think literature is, you know, just art in the form of the written word. So literature is an artistic expression. And as with a lot of art, uh, literature is ambiguous. So what does that word mean, ambiguous? I think a lot of people think that if something is ambiguous, that means it's confusing. Well, something that is ambiguous might be confusing because it is ambiguous. Uh, but to be ambiguous means that there are more than there's more than one way of seeing it more than one way of uh, interpreting it or analyzing it. And all, all of these various ways uh, are more or less equally valid. It just sort of depends on what method or, or what take you have on it. So the short stories we're going to be reading, I think, are all you know, very good classic examples of literary short fiction. And they all are to some degree or another ambiguous. We can uh, sort of read them and interpret them and analyze them from a number of different standpoints. And all of these different sort of approaches, all of these different doorways into a short story, like I say, are all more or less equally valid. And this is something we'll talk about again another day. Um, the individual reader, you know, has a certain leeway in interpreting a short story. You know, an author is, is definitely going to have some sort of intent and, of course, you know, creates characters and conflicts and plot. Um, and we have to honor that. We can't just ignore it. Um, so we can't come up with sometimes what I call left field interpretations. You know, we have to stick to the script, so to speak, to, to a certain degree. But even within that, we have some, some wiggle room. Well, as a result of literature and art, I think in general, being ambiguous, uh, we have a toolbox, if you will, of various literary theories that we could use to um, approach uh, a short story, uh, approach a work of art. And uh, we can use that specific tool out of that toolbox to help us interpret and understand and greater uh, appreciate and enjoy um, a work of, of short fiction. So we have a variety of what we call literary theories to use. And we use the word theory because it isn't the only way to see a short story. Um, it's a theoretical approach. Now, unlike theory 
in a scientific discipline, ultimately, we're never going to find one theory um, to rule them all, so to speak. We're, we're never going to convert a theory, a literary theory, into a law and say, oh, this is the theory. This is the correct theory. This is the way, it, 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 this is the only way to read a short story. No. In literature, all of these competing theories work side by side, and again, they're all equally valid. We're never going to go beyond sort of the theory stage. So here we have a short list of some of the more common literary theories. Um, some of these, you know, come, come and go out of fashion over time. We have something called biographical theory. This is where we read a short story and we really pay attention to the author's life and the author's uh, times and we, we try to learn as much as we can about the author and we try to link the author's biography, the author's life, to the work and see how the life affected the work and vice versa. Uh, historical and cultural theory, it's kind of similar except we're looking at the historical period in which the story was written. We're looking at the culture that produced the short story and we're looking at how the story reflects that history and that culture. Uh, psychological theory, um, this is a, a theory in which we sort of delve into the psychology of, of characters. Uh, we look for character motivations. We look for uh, unconscious uh, motivations and desires that might be driving the actions of characters. Uh, in essence, we sort of do a psychoanalysis of, of characters. That's not the only way psychological theory works, but that's one of the main ways. Political theory, uh, sort of uh, an umbrella term for a variety of theories. Uh, we have something called Marxist theory. This is where we look at socioeconomic class and how it works and helps motivate characters in a short story. Uh, we have feminist and gender theory. Here we, we look at the power imbalances between genders. Um, there's a whole uh, post-colonial theory. This is where we look at a uh, literature that was written outside of a uh, sort of a Western European context uh, and, and how it relates to and critiques Western and, and, and European influence. There's a variety of political theories out there. Uh, STEM, I just call it STEM theory. This is where we take principles of science and technology, engineering and mathematics, and we apply them to short stories and art in general. Um, this sort of approach has really been popular and has really taken off over the past 10 years, and it's a very interesting field. Uh, we have things like uh, sort of more complicated abstract theories like structural and post-structural theories, uh, as well as postmodern theories. Well, the literary theory that we are going to employ in this class is a theory called formalism, uh, and it's sometimes also known as new criticism. A little later on uh, this summer, starting I think with paper three, uh, either three or four, I can't recall now, we'll uh, experiment a little bit with another theory called reader response theory. So let's focus our attention a little bit on formalism. Formalism is a, is a theory that was developed at the very tail end of the 19th century and the early uh, couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, it was primarily a Russian uh, uh, school of thought. We, we, we originally talk about Russian formalism. Um, and formalism is sort of a uh, contemporary reaction against what was the sort of prevailing method of literary analysis at the time. And that was this sort of highly romantic view of literature and art in general as being this sort of almost divine, um, divinely inspired work uh, that, that artists 
produced. Uh, an artist, a literary writer, was someone who was in touch with a higher truth, and they were sort of a vessel for this higher truth to manifest itself on Earth. Um, artists were sort of uh, metaphors for God, in a sense. They 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 were able to. Human beings could not create a flower or a tree. Instead, they created a poem, which was also this beautiful thing. Okay, so it was this very sort of highly romantic um, view that really put artists and writers on a pedestal uh, as being these sort of uh, creative geniuses who who stood above the rest of us and channeled these higher truths about about the universe. Formalism was developed, uh, among other approaches, was developed as sort of a reaction to this. Uh, formalism eventually, you know, makes its way around the world and in the United States, uh, it takes root uh, sort of in the middle part of the 20th century after the F Second World War. Um, really what happens is that you have all of these returning soldiers coming home from the war and they've got the GI Bill and they're going to college. And uh, universities and colleges are uh, trying to find um, a way for these returning soldiers to, you know, take these sort of core curriculum classes and uh, uh, study uh, art and culture, um, but they want to do it in this little more down-to-earth way. You know, by the time the Second World War is over, these highly romantic notions uh, uh, that that uh, that that uh, theorists and analysts used. Um, have really kind of been shot to hell. You know, really, the, the First World War really did a, did a number on that, that sort of way of thinking. Uh, you know, these wars sort of showed us that, um, you know, life, life can be truly horrible and human beings are, are sure, maybe able to create beautiful poetry, but they're also able to create massive destruction. So uh, literary theory and artistic theory sort of comes down to earth a little bit uh, in, the, in, in the 20th century for sure. And formalism is one of these manifestations. So formalism provides um, a very direct uh, cause and effect primarily based approach to literature. It teaches students this, I think, very straightforward method for examining literature. Uh, and it doesn't rely on these, you know, sort of vague philosophical concepts about art. Uh, a lot of these old school theorists, you know, were very learned people. They read uh, endlessly and they were able to create all of these connections between various works of art. And they, they dove deep into the biographies and the lives of artists and whatnot. Formalism says, you know, we don't really need to do that. We don't, you know, that's nice and all, but we don't need to do that in order to uh, begin to have a fundamental understanding and appreciation of, a, of uh, something like a short story. So let's talk a little bit about some of the principles of formalism. Formalism assumes that the text itself, the story itself, along with at least a basic working knowledge of some literary terms and the concept of literary form is really all you need in order to begin to understand a work and begin to analyze a work. When we talk about form, you know, the word form is right there in formalism, form refers to the various strategies, methods, and choices, and that's an important word, choices that authors make and use when they are writing literature. So in short stories, these choices include what we call the elements of fiction. And you might remember that phrase from some of the policy material stuff uh, that we began the semester with. The elements of fiction, character, conflict, setting, narrator and point of view, plot, which of course we've already talked about a little bit, language, tone, as well as concepts like the central idea.
So we're not going to get to all of these elements of fiction um, during this term. There's just not, a, not enough time to cover everything, but we certainly will be covering uh, several of them. Uh, in paper two, we're going to be focusing on character and conflict. Paper one, of course, we're focusing on plot. Formalism seeks to explore what uh, writers refer to as the form content relationship in a story. The idea is that a writer has certain ideas, certain subject matter that they want to get across in a story. And formalism says that in order to do that, the writer has to choose certain forms that will communicate that subject matter eloquently and effectively to the reader. So the, this form content idea, this notion that writers, in order to communicate what they want to say well, they have to choose a form that's going to do that for them well. Uh, this this is true for any type of writer. I mean, a, uh, you know, a journalist, an essayist, uh, a novelist, uh, a songwriter. Um, you know, any any type of writing really requires writers to think about certain choices, certain certain strategies. Uh, if you remember back to comp one, you know, maybe you, you studied argument, hopefully, rhetoric. And, uh, you know, in, in comp one, we, we learned that uh, arguers need to pick and choose certain argumentative strategies in order to effectively address their audience. And so this is the same concept, except here we're talking about fiction. So we're looking at a different sort of set of tools. Formalism strives to explain connections between these various form choices within a story. And it seeks to investigate how these form choices help communicate and help promote the subject matter and the content of a story. Uh, one of the ways formalism does this is by really investigating the cause and effect relationships between form and content. So we sort of read a story, uh, we sort of reverse engineer it in a sense, we, we consider you know, the choices that the writer made, and then we investigate, well, what are the ramifications of those choices? What are the effects that those initial choices on the author's part have on readers? Formalism also, you know, seeks to understand stories by recognizing their organic nature, right? Form and content are linked. They're very closely linked together. One of them affects the other and vice versa. Um, you know, I was saying uh, in regards to plot, it's really important to take an entire plot into consideration. You know, when you're writing or, or speaking about a short story, uh, you need to make sure that you're taking the entire story into account. You can't just forget or, or, or sort of uh, gloss over a part of the story that maybe you don't fully understand. Um, that that stuff is important. Everything everything is important in a short story. Sure, in a novel there might be plenty of pages or paragraphs that are optional. You know, you could read through them and. Yeah, maybe they're interesting, but they're not necessarily that relevant or that terribly important to the novel as a whole. But in a short story, you can bet that most everything is going to carry some weight. So formalism likes to look at parts of a story, you know, maybe parts of a plot or elements of a character or something like this. Uh, maybe one one of the many settings that a story has. And formalism likes to look at that and, and discuss and analyze how that relates to the whole, how that part of the story is relevant to the entirety of the story, how it helps realize and, and make, make this, the full story manifest to the reader. Formalism um, can also look at oppositions and tension and juxtapositions within a story. 
you know it's it's uh i think it's uh important to 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 know that and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about conflict um stories uh are full of oppositions and, and juxtapositions and, and conflict is just one of these um we we want tension in a story right we want that forward momentum and that manifests itself through juxtaposing ideas juxtaposing characters juxtaposing imagery there's all sorts of ways that we can have juxtapositions and oppositions within a short story and formalism likes to examine that uh, formalism is also interested in characterization how is it that uh, readers come to understand character what sort of processes and strategies does the writer choose to use to uh, show character to us in a short story formalism can also examine um, sort of deeper language uh, strategies and structures like figurative language metaphors similes personification irony etc uh, motifs which are sort of recurring ideas or recurring images in a story symbols uh, symbols are, are tricky things uh, you know I know it's very common for uh, in English teachers to you know s sort of teach a short story as if it's a, a code book and you, you have to read all the the symbolic codes in order to understand a short story and I'm going to tell you now that um, I don't think that's a very effective way of looking at a short story sure stories can contain symbols but just because it's a short story doesn't mean that it's all symbolic um, I think re readers need to, to take some time and and trust that the story is sort of there at the surface there on its face value and not try to read too deeply into uh, into things there are symbols that occur but they're not always that common and uh, they're certainly not the central thing we should worry about when we read read a short story so there are, th those are just th that's just a very brief sort of introduction to what formalism is there are many other doorways many other paths into a formalist approach the one sort of common characteristic of any formalist approach or analysis of a short story is that it takes form as its number one consideration it, it starts with form and it, it really it ends with form as well we, we we look at the form of a short story the various strategies and elements that compose a short story and we run with those and, and investigate the short story um, from the the standpoint of, of form so that's sort of a, again a basic understanding of the underlying theory at work here one of the things that formalism does investigate is something called the central effect of a story the central effect of a story there's many ways that we could talk about this but I'm going to start with uh, some ideas from a very famous American writer I know you've heard of him before Edgar Allan Poe uh, there's a story of his in our book actually it's called the cask of Amontillado uh, Poe was um, in many ways probably our very first celebrity author um, Poe was uh, almost like a rock star of his time he, he was not one of these uh, writers who became uh, you know known after death Poe was famous during his lifetime and he you know did sort of go in and out of favor in fact after Poe died um, his name was sort of dragged through the mud and he he almost disappeared for a while until he was sort of brought back by uh, a bunch of uh, French uh, academics and, and readers who thought Poe was fantastic and uh, they sort of reintroduced Poe back to American audiences um, Poe's uh, work um, you know there, there are those who say that Poe has really sort of invented the detective story he invented the horror story um, he invented the thriller 
Uh, Poe is, uh, is a really amazing writer and um, he's one of our best and, and earliest American writers. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, we talk about the short story as a literary form. The short story as we know it today and as we're studying it in this class, you know, is really a pretty recent invention. Um, you know, uh, 18th century, late 18th century, 19th century, this is when the short story really begins to be developed and, and then perfected, I think, in the 20th century. Um, and there are, you know, early short story writers from a variety of different places, different countries. But I'm going to kind of go out on a limb here and say that the, the short story as we know it today, the literary short story as we know it today, is very much an American creation. And Poe goes a very long way toward making that so. Um, of course, human beings have been telling each other short stories since the dawn of time. You know, we have myths and fables and folklore stories. We have things like sermons. You know, short stories are surround us. They, they abound. But when we're talking about a literary genre or a literary form of story, uh, the short story, this is, again, a, a relatively recent invention. Anyway, Poe um, not only was a short story writer, he was a poet. He was also a critic, and he wrote many essays, uh, reviewing other people's work and just sort of writing about writing itself. And he has a famous essay called The Philosophy of Composition. And in it, Poe writes, I prefer commencing with the consideration of an effect, of the innumerable effects or impressions of which the heart the intellect or the soul is susceptible, which one shall I, on the present occasion, select? So Poe is, in the philosophy of composition, he's writing about how writers write, or at least how he writes. For Poe, he wouldn't sit down and start writing a story until he knew what the end result within the reader should be. He wouldn't start writing a story until he had determined what effect he wanted to impart to the reader. And in this quote, he talks about the effect, the effects or the impressions of which the heart, the intellect, or the soul is susceptible. So here he seems to be talking about the heart, the effects on the heart, emotional effects of a short story. He talks about the intellect, the effects on the mind and the intellect of a reader. And then he talks about the effects upon the soul of a reader. So he's talking about effects from a variety of standpoints here, a variety of types of effects. We can have these sort of mental, intellectual effects. Maybe a short story can get us thinking about certain things. A short story can get us feeling certain ways. A short story can even affect us in a deeper soulful or perhaps even spiritual level. And Poe says he isn't going to put pen to paper until he knows what that effect is going to be. And then he writes the story and chooses the various elements and the various strategies and the various forms that are going to lead him to that effect. Now, Poe writes at length about this, and um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I went to, to graduate school and studied short fiction um, and uh, encountered a, you know, a, a lot of writers in my life, fellow writers in workshops and whatnot. And I got to say, 
Um, I don't think many writers work that way. <laughs> I think many writers, including myself, uh, have uh, sort of uh, uh, primitive, uh, 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 sort of vague ideas about characters and settings and concepts. And then we start writing and we just sort of see where that leads. We don't have this, this uh, perfectly set idea of what we want the reader to feel or think at the end of the story, and then we carefully construct the story to that end. You know, some writers do, I guess. Poe po claims that that's how he wrote, but I know a lot of writers, including myself, you know, just can't write that way. So when Poe writes the philosophy of composition, he's certainly speaking for himself, uh, although certainly other writers probably wrote that same way too. Uh, in another uh, famous essay of Poe's called The Brief Prose Tale, uh, this is an essay in which he, he tries to outline the characteristics of a short story. You know, he says that a, a, a good short story, should you should be able to read it within one hour, <laughs> for instance. Um, and he, he gives some other interesting uh, qualities and characteristics of what he thinks a good short story should have. Uh, but at, at one point in there, he sort of brings this concept of effect up again. He says, the unity of effect or impression is a point of the greatest importance. So for Poe, that effect was very much always on his mind. That is, like I say, not always going to be true for all writers. But I think it is safe to say that regardless of whether a writer uh, uh, wrote the story with the intention of creating an effect or a specific effect, regardless if that was true or not, stories do affect readers. We read a story and we walk away from a story having been affected by it in some manner. So we can say that an effect of a story on the reader is usually something intended by the author, you know, perhaps very strongly in the case of Poe, perhaps, you know, somewhat ambiguously on the, on the part of other writers. It's usually something that is intended by the author. It's an intended result that the writer has in, intended to, to impart upon the reader. But this effect, By the reader to some degree. Uh, you know, we oftentimes say in, in, when we talk about literature that, you know, the reader is doing a lot of the work. Uh, the writer has done the work, but now it's up, for the, uh, up to the reader to really complete the process by reading the story very carefully. So, based upon Poe's idea of an effect, Let's categorize effects in three different ways. The central claim, the central impression, and the central idea. So a central claim is going to be an opinion that the author has, some sort of stance or position that the author is taking some sort of claim that the author has that the story seems to be communicating or arguing to the reader. Um, you know, instead of the writer sitting down to write an argumentative essay, they sit down to write a short story that serves as a way to argue a certain idea to a reader. Short story as argument, I guess, is maybe the shorthand way of talking about a central claim. So without going on and on and on about this, um, there was a time when uh, stories and, and poems and plays were prescriptive. In other words, they were written in order to teach people things as well as to um, argue certain ideas to them. 
so for instance, uh, there was uh, in medieval times something known as the shepherd plays. And these were plays that were sort of written and staged for peasants and farmers. And they were uh, allegorical stories, usually uh, taken from the Bible. And uh, the, the, their, their point was to teach certain moral and spiritual lessons to the common folk, right? So you had characters who represented uh, peace and mercy and God's love and all of these sorts of allegorical figures. And they interacted with each other and the whole point was to sort of teach a lesson. Uh, sermons. Uh, you know, if you've ever been to church, a, a minister or a priest uh, will sermonize and, and tell stories, perhaps from the Bible, perhaps from real life. But the point of the sermon, the point of the story is to impart sort of a teaching to the, to the listeners. Uh, fables, you know, like Aesop's fables, those all sort of deal with uh, various moral and ethical questions. Um, so we certainly do have short stories uh, in our human history that uh, were intended to argue and make claims and teach things to people. But certainly over time, and certainly uh, in the 20th century, um, that's really been downplayed. Short stories, uh, the main purpose, I think, for most writers is, is not to try to argue a position or make a claim about anything. Uh, and yet, we can read any short story and perhaps decipher some sort of um, argument between the lines. And there are you know, multiple ways that we, could, we can try to uncover that using other uh, literary theories. So the central claim is going to be some sort of argument that the story is giving off to the reader. The central impression, this is um, what Poe was talking about when he talked about the heart and the soul. So a central impression is going to be less of a, you know, an intellectual uh, effect and it's going to be more about an emotional effect or a psychological effect or a maybe even spiritual response if you're so inclined uh, that's generated as a result of, of reading the short story. Uh, for instance, with Cathedral, uh, the Raymond Carver story. You know, I've, I've read that story hundreds of times and I've taught it, uh, you know, many, many, many semesters. I'm no stranger to that story. Uh, but every time I read it, I get a little choked up at the end because I just think that this, even though it's a very simple story in many ways, um, watching this narrator, this character, evolve over the course of that evening and arrive at that place that he arrives at at the end of the story for me is just incredibly moving and you know i have all sorts of uh, intellectual and mental thoughts about the story and interpretations of the story um, and lots of interesting ideas that i like to kick around when i think about that story but that emotional effect at the end of the story is one of the reasons why I, I really love Cathedral. So that's an example of a central impression. You know, for Poe, uh, a lot of those stories, that uh, impression at the end is one of unease and, and horror. Uh, if you want to read The Cask of Amontillado, I, I welcome you to do it. Um, uh, it, it, it it's, a, it's a very uh, unsettling story in many ways. And it certainly leaves uh, a reader not only with uh, some interesting ideas, but also some some very um, deeply, <laughs> deeply felt and somewhat uncomfortable uh, effects that linger long after the story's over. Well, so in this class, we're going to not we're not going to talk about the central claim of a story. We're not really going to talk about the central impression of a story. We're going to focus on the central idea of a story. Um, if you choose to write the A paper, you might have some opportunity to play around with some of these other types of, types of effects. But really, for all of our required papers, um, this term, we're going to focus on uh, central idea.
Um, so that's the end of part one of this presentation. Part two, we're going to pick up with central idea. We're going to define what it is and what it is not. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to compose a central idea. I'll give you uh, kind of a quick formula that you could use to help you compose a central idea statement. And uh, again, we'll be using the Raymond Carver story cathedral as our example. So make sure that you've read that a few times so that you know what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, the central idea of, of cathedral. Well, we'll see you in part two.